You're listening to the Born to Kick Ass podcast with Matt Tomassi and can be found at borntokickass.com slash episode 52. Welcome to the Born to Kick Ass podcast, where you're introduced to the most fascinating people on the planet. Learn the ingredients of greatness that you can apply to your life. And now your host, Matthew Tomassi. John Van Wisser is an extreme triathlete and three-time winner of the prestigious 48km Manhattan Island Marathon Swim. John is also one of only 24 people in the world to have completed arguably the toughest ultra-triathlon on Earth, the Enduro Man Arch to Arc. The Arch to Arc starts with a 140km run from London's Marble Arch to Dover then continues with a 34km swim across the freezing English Channel, then finishes with a 291km ride from Calais to the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. In 2014, John broke the world record, finishing in 61 hours and 27 minutes. Enjoy the interview. John Van Wisser, welcome to the Born to Kick Ass podcast. Thanks, mate. Thanks for having me. Uh, how was the coaching tonight? Oh, it's good. Yeah, um, I just um, I just run my own business, so I just hire lanes at a pool, and um, I get yeah, a mix of triathletes and yeah. open water swimmers, and people just keep who want to just keep fit. And yeah. so I never know how many people will turn up, and just hope it's busy. And been doing that for like twenty odd years, and it's uh, still going. It's a good good lifestyle. So it's always. Always uh, very early starts. I'm, I'm up at four tomorrow morning, and yep. you know at the pool at quarter to five, and right. uh, then I'm back there at night again. So I got got kind of weird hours, but well, gives me time during the day to train. So, what sort of hours do you do? Do you get up at four pretty much every day, or, or most days? Yeah, most 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 uh, well, weekdays I get up at four. Yeah, um, and I open the pool up, so I've got to get there. The squad actually starts at about five fifteen, but yep. I've got to get there about quarter to five and have everything ready in. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then I, I finished about 8.39 and then um, and I'm back at the pool again at night for a few more hours. So yeah. it's kind of six days a week like that. So, now you've so kind coached. of it adds up. People think I don't work, but it kind of adds up. Now you've actually coached a number of um, channel swimmers. Is that right? Yeah. So yeah, I lost count. I reckon I've coached about 20 odd. So how long, like if someone came to you and said, I want to attempt to swim across the English Channel. What's sort of the process? Do you sort of assess their swimming ability uh, as of sort of that point in time and then tailor a, a coaching uh, program and training for that particular uh, person? Yeah, I mean, everyone's different. So some, sometimes it's more psychology. Yep. You know, it's going over the pros and cons of what, what you can face, you know, like the worst case scenarios in the channel and, um, you know, uh, how how much body fat they've got to put on for the cold water. Um, yeah, how much how many kilometers they can actually handle during the week and uh, nutrition, what kind of food works for them. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it depends on the person. Every every I've had all kinds of I've had um I had the oldest Australian who crossed oh, in two thousand and ten. He, he was late fifties, not the oldest anymore, he's crossed but he couldn't swim two years before, and he got across, but it took him 22 hours. Yeah. And uh, he actually crossed the same time I did a double crossing. So we had a boat each, and um, I did him a double crossing quicker than he did his single. Oh, so right. he, he said he won the award for being in the water longer. But... Yeah, yeah. Jeez, that would have been <laughs> But he was an amazing man. Like, he, he was mentally tough as nails. Yeah. Uh, he couldn't swim two years before he attempted the channel. And it was a really rough night that night, too. It was shocking conditions. Like, yeah. seven other people got pulled out trying to do singles that yeah. That night, he got across. It took him took him a whole day nearly, oh. but he just um, you know he just stayed in the water and he had enough body fat to handle the cold. And um, yeah, at that time he was the oldest Australian yeah. um, to get across. So that that was one of my real proudest um, moments because you know he, he, that was an incredible performance. Yeah. Also um, had the first Malaysian to cross the channel, which was really big. 
yeah. um, in Malaysia. So yeah. he was government sponsored. So he was sponsored by the, the then Prime Minister, Dr. Martyr. Yeah. And uh, I don't know how he found me, but he just um, called me and said, oh, I want to come to Australia and train with you. And he came to Australia and um, I got him to swim 100 metres and he could he could barely swim. He used to be he used to be a cyclist. He was like a Commonwealth Games track cyclist. Yeah. And uh, he wasn't a swimmer at all. And and um, so I thought, oh, geez, how's he going to go? And I sent him away off to Europe to do some races. And he finished like some 25K swim race. I thought, geez, he's got a big heart. Yeah. He came back um, a few months later with, with a documentary crew. Um, and then I remember he said, I've, I've got to go back to Malaysia to do, um, you know, a marathon swim to, to please my sponsors. And I, and I thought, oh, that's not good. You know, Malaysia's a tropical country. We're training for the channel. But he said he had to do it. So uh, we went Malaysian Airlines. I remember reading the, the newspaper and I had a picture of him, you know, with saying 10 days till he swim. I thought, geez, this is pretty big. I didn't. Then we got off the plane and there were all the cameras there. And I thought, I couldn't believe how, you know, in Malaysia it was big news. And we were like front page of the paper every day. And, you know, the, the prime minister was, you know, at, at the event and he jumped on the boat and, um, luckily he finished the training swim and, uh, and then I gave him a few weeks off and then he came back again and we trained for a few more months through winter in Melbourne and uh, we went to England and he had massive support. He had uh, like two support boats full of media and he got across. He had a beautiful day. It was like a 30 degree flat day and he yeah. did it quite comfortably. Um, and then we went back to Malaysia and, you know, he had like thousands of people waiting for us at the airport and yeah. the prime minister met us at the airport and, um, he got he got um, knighted over there. It's called a Dutto title. Yeah. So he was the youngest ever Dutto. Um, he got an apartment given to him in his hometown Penang. And uh, what else he got? He got um, a Proton car, which is a Malaysian car given to him. Just a national. I remember when I left the um, the airport, I, I didn't have to show my passport. I was like like the rock stars manager kind of thing. So yeah. it was really big. And I got back home, and no one knew no one knew anything about it. It was like. Yeah. You know, I was like, uh, yeah, from, from one extreme to the other. Yeah, that'd be fun. So, yeah, that was, that was another interesting, um, you know, story. Yeah, especially uh, if he's coming from Malaysia, you know, the tropics or sort of near the equator, yeah. you know, he'd be used to the hot humidity and, uh, you know, attempting the, uh, the, the channel swim, the, uh, the, you know, the change in temperature and... Uh, um, oh, so the yeah. Malaysians don't like swimming, so, yeah. so that, was, that was a huge story there and... The Prime Minister then, Dr. Martyr, he he basically wanted to show that Malaysians could do, could achieve anything they put their mind to it. Yep. So apparently he sponsored the first Malaysian to climb Mount Everest and also the first Malaysian that sailed around the world. So uh, Malik, who was the swimmer, um, he actually, his boss of his work knew the Prime Minister. So that's how he got in contact with the Prime Minister. And the Prime Minister sent people down to see if he could actually swim. Yep. And, then, um, and then he contacted me and... I don't know how, he, how I got involved, but yeah, he contacted me and, and then it started from there and I couldn't believe, you know, how big it was in his country and uh, it was just a, you know, it's a massive story over there because, yeah, Malaysians don't like swimming, they don't like the cold. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so, yeah, it was a huge, um, it was a great adventure for me and, you know, it was, that was another great story. Now, um, you, you've done a lot of uh, swimming and we can get into a, a lot of the stuff that you've uh, done and ac- accomplished. Were you or was swimming always your base or your main sport growing up, or were you? Cause, and I noticed you also done a lot of triathlons. What was sort of your base growing up, sports wise? Oh no, swimming. Was it? Always a swimmer, Maddie. So um, I swam as a kid, and uh, we did. My sister and I did life saving as kids, so we did that for twenty odd years. And then uh, I used to do a lot of aquathons, um, trying to chase prize money. I did pretty well. Because I was coaching a lot of triathletes, they said, oh, you should, you know, get on a bike. So I took up triathlon pretty late, probably 26, 27 yeah. years old. So I, I wasn't, um, I was just a swimmer, but I could still run okay. So, um, yeah, so I took up um, triathlon, yeah, probably my mid to late 20s and yeah. learned how to ride a bike and run. Is aquathons uh, swim and run? Yeah, there were, there were a few around in Melbourne that had a bit of prize money. So I'd, yeah. I'd, do, I'd do those to chase the prize money. And I do pretty well, and you know, the people, my triathletes in my squad, go, "Oh, you just beat so and so," and you know, you should get on a bike. And yeah. and um, I thought, oh, I thought the bike would be easy. And the guy got me on a bike. He was, you know, probably 15 years older than me. He took me down the velodrome. He lent me a bike, and he just smashed me. And I thought, Jesus! I didn't realise how hard how hard it was to ride a bike. Yeah. Uh, 
yeah, so it took a while to learn how to ride the bike. And yeah, so yeah. did Ironman for a few years and, you know, really enjoyed it. And then I got back into the marathon swimming again. Um, and then I did marathon running for a while. So yeah. I just um, chopped and changed. So with the swimming, did you, were you like, you know, as you're growing up, was it predominantly in the pool or a lot of your accomplishments seem to be, you know, uh, open water swims. Were you doing pool or open water from a young age or did you sort of transition into the open water uh, as you got No, nah, it's always open water. I, was, um, I probably didn't get really serious in my swimming until I was about 17. And, um, what did I do? I swam, swam across Port Phillip Bay, uh, which is a 40K from Port Arlington to Frankston. And then um, that uh, year, that was like a training swim for the English Channel. So then... Then I went over the English Channel and I actually didn't get across. I stopped breathing. I had to get resuscitated. Yeah, this was um, in 93. Dawn right? Fraser. Dawn Fraser was on the boat. She actually saved my life. And, yeah, I remember and, um, that. Yeah, so I, I, did, I was pretty stressed after that. I didn't want to go back and Dawn talked me into going back. So I ended up putting on 23 kilos of body fat and I went back the next year yeah. and I, I got across. So, so yeah, so... Um, so- just what, did stuff like that. So what actually happened? Like this was in 93 and yeah. what, what happened? Did you almost drown or what was the conditions like? No, nah, I was too skinny. I, I had like a six pack and you can't, you know, I was just young and skinny. I couldn't put weight on. Uh, it was a cold summer that year. So we had really cold water and four, six winds. It was a bad day and no sun. And I, was, I was actually swimming really well till about six hours. And then it's kind of like, um, you know, when you're watching telly at night or reading a book late at night and you just, wake up the next morning, the TV's still on, or the book's on your lap, you just fall asleep. So it's quite peaceful. So yeah. I ended up just falling asleep in the water and right. the, everyone dived in apparently and I apparently had to get resuscitated. And I woke up with Dawn, you know, hugging me and one of those space blankets on. And yeah. So it was pretty traumatic because um, cause I thought, you know, even though I was skinny, I thought I'd still get across. And um, So I didn't want to go back, but Dawn talked me into it. And so I put on 23 kilo and that was, that was a big effort because, you know, I was a, I was still young, so I still had a high metabolism. Yep. It's easy to get fat now, but when I was that age, it was hard. And yeah. I was doing things like eating, you know, five Big Macs and things. So I was eating, you know, till you're uncomfortable. Yeah. And um, the next year I went back and it was, the water was two or three degrees warmer. We had a sunny day. It wasn't, it was quite flat. So it was a totally different conditions. And um, yeah, then, you know, I, you know, I had a good swim the next year, got across and yeah. had no dramas. And, yeah. yeah, so, so it was a, so yeah, was, it was quite quite traumatic the first time. So was Dawn Fraser like your coach uh, for the English Channel swim, or was she just? Yeah, like she a- would come on our big swims. Like my sister also does marathon swimming, so yeah. um, so Dawn went on a lot of. Uh, like my sister swam the Loch Ness and the Murray River, and uh, from across um, Bass Strait from King Island to Apollo Bay. So Jeez. it's um, ninety-seven k, and so Dawn was always on all the trips and. Yeah. And um, yeah, so Dawn was on my boat for the for the Channel swim. So I was, yeah, we're really lucky. We always had good adventures because yeah. you know all around the world, everyone knows her, and she's such a such a lovely lady and really down to earth. And so, so, so yeah, it was great great having her on a lot of lot of those swims. Yeah. <clears throat> so for I guess for listeners who don't know who Dawn Fraser is, um, she's one of you know the Australia's all time greatest sports people of yeah, all time. Yeah, she won um, she won three Olympics in the hundred meter freestyle. Back to back, in row, so. yeah, three, yeah, three hundreds, in a row, so. three in a row. Yeah, she would have won four, but she um, got involved in some drama with stealing the flag, yeah. which I don't think she even did. Yeah. She copped the rap and she missed the fourth Olympics, which she probably would have won four. Yeah, she was the first um, lady to break the minutes at a hundred freestyle. All right, yeah. So she, yeah, she was an amazing swimmer, and yeah. just a lovely lady, and um, so we were really lucky um, to have her along. And so how long? She, have she you kind known? of liked what we did because. What's that? How long have you known Dawn Fraser for? Oh, that was years ago. So that was in the, um, that was 92 to 94 kind of thing when we were doing the swims then. Yep. Oh, then 99 when Tammy swam um, Loch Ness, Dawn came over for that. So, yes, yeah, she's come over for a lot of lot of the big uh, big swims. Yep. So she's she, we've been really lucky. She's fantastic. She just, in, she just appreciates because it's something totally different than what she did. Yeah. Yeah, you know, she, she swam for a minute. Did she sort of give you heaps of good um, uh, mental strategies? You know, on how to approach oh, she was the swim fantastic. and stuff. Yeah. Oh, like she would do. She would do the homework on all the tides and food, and yeah. she wouldn't take any crap. So if anyone yeah. tried to pull the wool over her eyes, she was straight on a woman. Yeah. She just she always had your back. She was really good. Yeah. And like I said, and it was so inspiring having like you know 
like Olympic, you know, one of the greatest yeah. athletes of all time, you know, on your boat. It was, it was good, good times. And so, yeah, so we, we were really lucky um, to have her along. And so, yeah, she ended up saving my life uh, that day. So. so you can say uh, you had, you've received mouth to mouth by Dawn Fraser. Yeah, I can't remember it, but <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so it was a pretty traumatic time, and yeah. it's um, got back the next year and got across. And like I said, the next year was a totally different day. It was a better summer and flat, warm conditions, and you know, I was I was super fat the next year. And so, tell us the approach. Like, if you're, you know, you've done the training, you, you know, you're you're going to make an attempt for the English Channel, and obviously, you, you've done the sw- swimming training. Do you sort of have a certain amount of kilos that you want to sort of pack on, and why? Why do you want to pack on? Is that sort of to uh, keep your core body temperature uh, warm during the swim? Is that sort of why you you pack on the uh, the extra extra weight? Yeah, I mean you got to work out how long you're going to be in the water for. Yeah. Um, so so if you're going to be in the water longer, you got to be even bigger. So it depends. So if I'm coaching someone, I've got to work out how long I think. You know, worst case scenario, they'll be in the water for. So I always. I always tell them as soon as you know, it's better to have an extra couple of kilos than too little, or rather, you know, they're too too fat than too skinny. Because yep. uh, what happens with the cold water, you can be okay for a while, but once you start getting, you know, tired and the cold creeps in, you never get warm again. It just gets worse and worse. Yeah. And it just um, becomes Chinese torture. And before you know it, you, you're falling asleep, you know. So it's just, um, yeah, unfortunately, um, yeah, if, you, if you're too skinny, eventually the cold, the cold gets you. So, yeah. But you just have to work out you know, how much body fat you actually need. Um, obviously, the fatter you are, the slower, the slower you get. But when, you, when you're in cold water, you've, you know, it's survival too. So, yep. so you've got to find that balance. Are there any sort of rules with the swim in regards to wearing a, a, a wetsuit? Can you wear a wetsuit on the English Channel swim or not? Oh, if you're just doing a, a channel swim by itself, you can't. If you're yep. doing the arch to arc, you can wear a wetsuit because it's, yep. it's a triathlon. So... Yeah. So that becomes a different event again because you don't have to be as fat. So because obviously you don't want to be too fat if you're going to run 140k. We'll get into the arch to arc in a sec. I just want to keep going with the swim. Um, yeah, no worries. Did you do you sort of cover yourself in fat, like you know, lard to sort of? Yeah. Did you do that? As it's well? funny because um, back back in the early 90s when we were doing it in in Melbourne, you use uh, wool fat, which is what uh, women use for breastfeeding. So. You go to the chemist and you, and you try and get a massive tub of wool fat, and they think you're a weirdo. You know, you know what are you using this for? <laughs> and then um, when you get to England, they had this stuff called channel grease, which you could buy at Boots Chemist. Yeah. They always kept it under the counter because so so many people in um, in Dover try and attempt the channel. So so that, and they wouldn't tell you the ingredients. It was basically like a secret. It was mm-hmm. it was kind of just a mix of Vaseline and wool fat and lanolin. But uh, these days, they actually reckon you shouldn't use too much because they reckon it clogs your pores. So six or seven hours in, it's not good for your your skin to breathe. Yeah. So now, now the, the latest theory is you just put it where you chafe, you know, around your neck and under your armpits. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, back back when we were doing the early nineties, it was about covering your whole body. And you know, you'd look, you'd walk in. I still got a photo of me the first year. I had, um, I just looked like a, you know, like a mummy. I was just full of white grease all over me. <laughs> it's horrible stuff too. You never, you know, it takes forever to get it off, and yeah. you got to throw those those speedos out. They never recover. All right, yeah, just sacrifice them. <laughs> yeah. Now, with the actual swim, um, are there rules around? Do you need to be like have an escort boat with you while you do the swim? Yeah, it's really good. Like the the rules, there's it used to just be one, but now there's they're broken into two. Is like an association and a federation, so. You um, basically, you you email them and then you try and um, work it. So they have a boatman. So there's X amount of boats that are available with a skipper and you book in a window and you generally get a one-week window, yep. which means um, you have to choose a day in that week. And they can book up to like four people in the, in the one week. It's, it's a massive business. All right. And so you could be number one, two, three, or four. So if you're number one, you get the option of the first best day. And then if... So you're number one and, and I'm number two. The boatman will go to you first for the first best day. And if you say, no, nah, I'm, I'm going to wait till Thursday, then they'll come to me and say, oh, you know, Maddie's declined that day. Do you want to swim today? And if I say no, then they'll go to number three. 
So you, you try and get number one spot. You try and get a you know a good tide. Yeah. But it's a big business there. It's it's booked up for um quite a few years. All the good spots. Yeah. So so um yeah people try it try it all the time in summertime. So that from kind of like um from uh, mid June I'd say till to mid September people are trying to yeah trying to get across. So it's yeah it's a big business. So what are you actually looking for with the tides? Are you are you sort of waiting for calm weather or high tide low tide? What are you sort of looking for when you um are about to de- uh depart so so basically the channel every week the tide changes so uh there's a neap tide and a spring tide so spring tides are always bigger tides that's when the sun and moon align yeah so a neap tide will go from like a three meter tide to up to about a six meter tide and a spring tide can go from um six to about eight eight plus meters so you can get weaker neaps and stronger springs so yeah the, the smaller the tide, the better, really. The boatmen tell you the um, the spring tides are okay, but the spring tide, you, you swim further, you're getting swept around more. Yep. So if you, if you miss the closest point of France, you, you can get swept right down. All right. Where, the, where the smaller neap tide, you can tend to swim a straighter line and you're not swimming on the spot as much at the end. So generally, yeah, the neap tides are, are the better tides to get if you can get them. Um, but then you're at the mercy of the weather because the tides are also going to be affected by... Um, by, by atmospheric conditions, so yeah. so um, yes, yeah, so you don't know what weather you'll get that week, and you know the, the English Channel weather can be really fickle. Yeah. So you you can go there and have a perfect day, and you say what's all the fuss about? But you can go there, and you know people have gone there and waited two weeks and had no no swimmable days. So um, yeah, it's just the luck of the draw. You just try and get the you know the best tide you can get, and then when you get there, you basically you know, at the mercy of the weather and you're just constantly calling the boatman and, and he, he checks the weather reports every 12 hours and um, gives you feedback on what he reckons. And you, at the end of the day, you're the one who says yes or no. And yep. uh, once you go, yeah, you just hope, hope you get, um, you know, good conditions. But they, they can often get it wrong too, you know, halfway in the channel and bad weather comes in. And um, I had a mate, uh, a, a footballer down here who tried to do it last year, um, Campbell Brown, and, he trained his backside off for it, and he um, he swam out, and about uh, I think eight hours in, a massive storm came in, twenty four hours early, and yeah. he was swimming on the spot for hours, and they had to pull him out, and everyone that was in the water that day got pulled out, and his coach um, actually booked a second window and didn't tell him, right. so he, he he went to um, to watch the cricket, the Ashes, and his coach called him and said, look, I've got another window for you, you're keen, so he said, yeah, no worries, so he went back two weeks later. Uh, waited at Dover, and for the next five days it was gale force winds, and no one swam. Yeah. So he got on the plane, got back, had to get back to work, came back to Melbourne, and the first day he got back, um, there was a similar day, and people were getting across. So, yeah. so he had no luck at all. Yeah. So that's just kind of one of those stories there. So you know, you can go there and you get a thirty degree flat day, and you know it's quite a comfortable swim, and yeah, you know, what's the big deal? And you get hear stories like Campbell had. Yeah. You know, where he's had two windows and couldn't get across. Yeah. You know, but he, had he had a decent day, he would have got across quite comfortably. So, so when you departed, so did you depart? What what sort of time of the day or night did you depart? Was it sort of morning uh, or the night? first time when I didn't when I didn't get across? I think we started. I think we started um, about four in the morning. Yeah. Um, yeah, you could leave. You have to leave at the high tide. So, yeah. the high tide runs for a few hours. That sweeps you out. Um, so the high tide runs, I think two or two times a day, maybe. So, so yeah, so, um, the bowman decides, you know, go and buy the swing speed. You tell him that you think you can hold. He, he works out, you know, what beach to leave from and what's the best time, you know, to, to beat the tide on the other side. So it's quite, quite a, um, complicated thing. So, and then, and then often, like I said, the weather can blow up out of nowhere and, you know, and, and what they thought was going to happen doesn't happen. And, yeah. You know, so so there's a, there's a little fair bit of luck too. So no two swims are ever the same. I'm guessing you can't hang on to the boat at all. If you do, does no, it sort they're, of they're really you? really strict. Yeah. Yeah. You, you um going back to that Malaysian guy, Coach Malik. Um, he um he was swimming into into France, and once you get to France, it gets he was he was landing on. You could land anywhere. Sometimes you land on rocks. He was lucky. He was landing on a beautiful 30 degree day uh, in a shallow beach, but the boat couldn't go all the way in because it was, it was too shallow. Yeah. And the boatman told me if anyone touches him, you know, before he's fully out of water, 
So say he's 20 metres from shore and he stands up and some got, someone goes up and gives him a hug, he's disqualified. Right. So we were trying to call the beach because there were, there were quite a few people on the beach, you know, celebrating already. And um, we couldn't contact anyone. So I dived in, sprinted up to him with my clothes on, had my mobile phone and my wallet in my pocket, sprinted up, luckily caught him before anyone touched him. Because yep. had, any, had anyone touched him, you know, when he when basically he was 20 metres from the shore, his whole swim would have been disqualified. So they're, they're really strict with the rules. Like you can't um, touch the boat. You've got to tread water. You've got to start and finish on land. So it um, doesn't matter where you finish. If you're fully out of water, even if you're landing on a rock in France, that's that's officially finished, but you've got to be fully out of water. Yep. So, yeah, they've had all these rules for 100-something years, and they're, they're, really, they're really good. They're really strict with it. Now, with the double crossing, how full on was that? Oh, that was really um, traumatic because that was another bad, bad window that we were stuck there for a few days because it was gale force winds. Yeah. Um, I was actually going for a triple crossing. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, but I didn't get the conditions, and um, they thought the weather would settle down after three hours. So, but it it stayed really rough for probably seven or eight hours. And um, by the time I got the first way, I knew you know I was bruised and battered, smashing through the waves and. I got a double in, but yeah, um, seven other people got pulled out trying to do singles that day. Yeah. So the only other guy that got across was um, was Richard, the old fellow that I coached. He, he got across in 22 hours, which, oh. you know, I reckon that was better than my double crossing. So yeah. he couldn't swim two years before and he got across and seven other people got pulled out. But yeah, yeah so I got a double in, but yeah, I just didn't get the conditions. Um, yeah. yeah, you need perfect conditions to do a, to do a triple. So with the double, did you? How long did you like? You got across the first time. How long did yeah. you rest or recuperate? Oh, 10 seconds. Really? So it's just like you yeah. swam across and then yeah. literally just turned around and went back again. No sort of yeah. Around. Oh, I wasn't messing about. Uh, um, yeah, it was funny because um, I had earplugs in. I was swimming in and I landed on these really shallow rocks and it was it was quite rough. So I was getting. Um, I was like a walrus because I, I got really fat for that swim. Yeah. And the waves would smash me on those, on those little rocks and I was getting cut up. And, and they were trying to tell me how I swam 20 metres around the corner. There was a little sandy beach there. So I ended up um, wasting minutes trying to actually get over these little rocks. And then I had to kind of like, you know, like a big fat sumo wrestler tiptoe back over these rocks. So I was full, once I was fully out of water, they'd blow the siren. Yeah. Then I pretty much just turned around and tip, tried to tiptoe back over the rocks. and. All right. Um, get back to deep water and swim back, and yeah, I was pretty got bruised up doing that. So, oh, that's an incredible. So, um, effort. Yeah, it was, it was a tough, tough um, double that day. It was really very tough conditions. And, so you did that just but, under um, twenty hours. The draw. Yeah, that took nineteen hours fifty five. Yeah, but I actually, I actually swam really well that day. It was just yeah, very, very uh, the first wave was just really I just smashed through waves and yeah. um, my whole forearms and wrists were just all you know, swollen and bruised from smashing through the the waves all night. I was just, I didn't, didn't get the window to do a triple, so yeah. I was pl- I was quite happy to get a double in in those conditions. Now you uh, you've also done, or you're the three time winner of the forty eight k Manhattan Island swim. That's around Manhattan Island in New York. Is that yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great, great. Um, have you been to New York before? No, Manhattan? never. No. Oh, it's magnificent. Yeah. Just a it's just a magnificent. It's like yeah, it's basically it's the capital of New York, um, Manhattan Island. So everything's on. The, you watch a movie now and you see all the you know Empire State Building and all the famous bridges, the George Washington Bridge and Wall Street and uh, uh, um, Central Park. Uh, it's amazing. There's so many things on the, on that uh, little island. Yeah, it was an annual race where you you start um, uh, basically where the Statue of Liberty is and you swim. Some around anti-clockwise around the whole island, yep. and it's generally it's limited to about 30, 30 swimmers. So you got to send an entry form off, and you got to get approved. And, yep. and uh, yeah, I, I love it there. It's just an amazing, amazing city. So is it like non-stop for forty-eight k's, just swimming? Yeah, it's not like a forty-eight k swim though, because you get the current, yep. the current with you when you get up to Hudson. So it's probably like doing a thirty to thirty-five kilometer swim. Yeah. Once you take the currents out, you actually swim 48 k. But yep. when you when you get up the Hudson, um, you, you look over and you, you're going past people that are running. You're just going. You just got the current behind you and you're just hammering. Yep. 
So it's a yeah, it's a it's a great swim. You you um you swim under the big bridge, the George Washington Bridge, and um you go through Harlem, which is that's the bit where there's like no currents and it's really dead water. Yep. That's the boring bit. It goes for about four hours. That bit. You swim. You swim past the um, Yankee Stadium, the baseball stadium. Right. Uh, it's just an amazing, amazing city. And, yeah, that'd be actually. Um, quite, yeah, I always love doing that. It'd be actually quite unique, you know. If, you know, obviously you're swimming and you're, you're putting the effort in, just stroke after stroke. But how long does it take? Like, how long did it take you um, to do the? To, oh, I've, I've to been varying, yeah, between seven hours and almost eight hours for one. Yeah. One time, so it depends on the. Some years are faster than others because um, because of, of the currents. But but the, when you um when you go up the Harlem, you go under this bridge called the Spite and Dival Bridge, and then once you go under that, you you turn up the Hudson, and that's where the big airplane landed. Yeah. And um and you know see that movie Sully where he where yeah, he yeah. flies the uh the airplane. Yeah. So you actually swim. So you, you go under the spot and double bridge, turn up the Hudson, and then about two kilometres down is that George Washington Bridge, yeah. and that's where the plane actually landed. And you swim under the bridge, and yeah. that's where the current starts picking up. It's a really big, big strip of water, and yeah, you end up once you get up to that bit, then you start hammering. Yeah, yeah, it's just amazing, and you see all the you know the famous buildings and yeah. bridges, and it's just incredible city. Yeah, that'd be uh, it'd be quite uh, unique swimming and actually seeing the. Uh, all the famous landmarks during the course of the swim. That'd be uh, quite yeah. Good. I actually took um. There's there's a boat trip that you take. You can take, and it has a commentator and it tells you all the history. So, so I, did, I always do that before the event because it's the actual same course that you're racing around. Yeah. And the commentator, you know, says, "Oh, this is where you know where Bruce Willis lives, and right. this is the George Washington Bridge, which Tarzan jumped off in the movie, and yeah. you know, this is Wall Street, and this is this, and." Yeah, so then you kind of learn about you know about what you swing past. Yeah. So I always um, do that do that tour before I do the race there, it's, and then you, and you learn about the incredible history of that place. Yeah. It's an amazing um, amazing city. How do you sort of maintain your focus when you know you're you're doing these marathon swims, whether it's uh, you know the the Manhattan Island swim or swimming what is it forty k's across Port Phillip Bay. How do you sort of maintain your your focus? Do you have any sort of tips that you use to uh, stay present? Oh, I kind of um, – I mean, it's a roller coaster. And no, no two events are ever the same. Well, um, when I was younger, I used to, you know, when you're full of, full of beans, I'd get all the heavy metal songs in my head. And I remember when I sang across the bar, I basically, you know, sung all the ACDC songs in my head. And now that would give me a headache, you know. So as you get older, you change. So, um, yeah, I mean, um, some swims you kind of, yeah, you zone out and everything goes really well and other times you, you have a bad swim and you've got to, you know, work harder and eat more and things don't go to plan. And yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's a real – I really always reckon marathon events are kind of like a metaphor of life. That they're all just compacted into one one event. You don't know what, you know, the, when the next punch is coming around the corner and yeah. you feel good sometimes and you feel terrible five minutes later and, it's all just packed into one at one event. So you kind of just hope you prepare the best you can. You kind of hope that you have a good day and you have less downs and, and more ups, but you never know on the day and you just try and zone out, whatever that means and get in a rhythm and hope that, um, yeah, you have a good day. But yeah, like I said, I've had channel swims where, you know, where I've had dramas and I've had channel swims where I've had an easy crossing and, mm. Uh, you know, I've had Manhattan swims that have been comfortable and Manhattan swims where I've struggled. And mm. uh, Yeah, it's never, never exactly the same. Um, you're also the 20 time, 21 time overall winner of the annual Harry Risebeck Winter Mile. Where's that? Yeah. Is that in well, Nardo, that's, um, uh, Victoria? That's a local, yeah, it's in our Port Phillip Bay, which um, in winter time, because it's shallow water, it gets very cold in winter, so it gets down to between six and eight degrees. Yep. So um, every year they have an annual race inside. It's called the Brighton Sea Bars. So it's basically just like a big square pier with still bars going down. So it's still in the bay, but it's, um, but yeah, it's kind of in, enclosed. So, um, yeah, they have an annual race there, no wetsuit allowed, um, in, you know, in, in seven degree water. So yep. uh, 1.6K. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah. So how yeah, do you deal? Uh, how do you deal with the uh, cold? Do you sort of 
Do you love the cold? You know, the freezing cold water? I actually perform better in cold. I mean, I've had some bad, you know, when I was young, obviously with the channel, I had a bad experience, but I actually, um, I'm much better. I don't like the hot days, you know, when you got to go for a run and things. I'm not, I actually go better when it's cold. So yeah. as, you, as you know, year after year, I'd swim through throughout winters and I got better every year and built, built your resistance up. And uh, I actually quite like the, uh, the cold these days more than, more than the heat. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the fir- the first winters that you go through are quite, quite tough. I remember I used to spend longer in the shower than I did in, in the actual bay in the first few years. Uh, but yeah, but the fattier you are too, the, the, the more resistance you've got, but I've done, done quite a few of those winter miles where I, you know, I was doing triathlons and I was really skinny. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you build, build up your resistance just through doing it every winter. And, uh, it certainly helps if you get in, um, frequently because yeah. you know, if you miss, if you miss two weeks and you know, the water drops say three degrees, it's a, it's a massive difference. Yeah. So yeah, it also helps if you get in all the time and, uh, you kind of climatize as the water drops, but, you, but yeah, so I've, I've done it my whole life. So I kind of just got, you know, more, res, more resistance to it as I got older. And, um, yeah, it's something, something about it. Like, um, you, you see people that swim through the winters and they all seem happy and healthy. Yeah. It's kind of like a, a, a contradiction. You think it's not healthy, Yeah, no, but, but people that do it seem to be, you know, quite invigorated by it and happy people. And, yeah. Um, yeah, so there's got to be something in it. I don't know what the science is behind it, but you know, it just seems that people that yeah, swim through winter they seem seem pretty happy. Yeah. Now I want to talk about uh, the arch to arc. Tell us about the arch to arc, the enduro man arch to arc. Where where is it? Yeah, tell us about that. It's called the arch to arc, Matty, because it starts in the Marble Arch of London, and you finish in the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. So so the first bit is a run leg, so you. So you run for the Marble Arch, you run 140k to the English Channel, you then swim the English Channel, and then you cycle from Calais, 291 kilometres to the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. Yeah. So, um, so it's run by a company called Enduro Man, and it's like the channel. You book in your window, and you get you get generally get a week's window, and and once again you basically you're doing it via the English Channel people. So you try and work out when the best swim day is, and then you backlog X amount of hours um, you think it'll take you to run to the channel and you have to get there by the high tide so so um, if you get there too early you can't go if you get there too late you've got to wait to the next high tide so you've got to work out how long you'll think the run will take you and how much rest you need until you take on the channel but the clock's always going yeah so so um, so what I did when I did it I gave the boatman 24 hours notice um, for the start of the high tide, and I did the run in um, 15 hours 50. So that meant um, I had up till 24 hours before I started the swim, so I could rest till then. But the clock's still going. Yeah. So then, um, then yeah, then you take on the channel, and you're allowed to wear a wetsuit because it's a triathlon. Then um, doesn't matter where you land, you have to start the bike at a certain spot in Calais, and then you then. Um, you can rest up to a maximum of 12 hours, but the clock's always going. Yeah. So the longer you rest, you know, the, the more your time's being added on to. Yeah. Um, but you have to get on the bike within 12 hours once you finish the swim. And then you then uh, ride to the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, which is so it's a 291 kilometre ride. So, yeah. so yeah, so you book your window in and um, they once again, they put observers on there. So the observer shows you the course. You have to get all the higher cars and, uh, look after the observer, and the observer logs it all, um, guides you on the course, and and he writes it down in history. So it's quite popular. Like people try it every week in summer. Yeah, I think I think about twenty two people have finished it now, and quite quite a few hundred people have attempted it. Yeah, there's there's probably been more people on the moon than uh, that have completed this. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's it's a. Because um, cause the channel, you know, the channel's such a tough swim. Even with a wetsuit, the channel's a tough swim. Because um, you know, even though even though you got a wetsuit on, you still when you start the swim, you're very fatigued because you've run 140 k. So so you've got less energy to fight the cold as well. well you've you've actually got a uh, a video on Vimeo, and I'll put the vi- I'll embed the video on the uh, in the show notes called oh, Crossing thanks, the Line. 
Uh, yeah. It's an awesome, it's a really good uh, video and I highly recommend people to uh, to watch it. You'd never run, can we maybe talk through each of the legs? Like the run yeah. is 140K, so it's over three marathons, you know, yeah. from uh, from Marble Arch in London to, to Dover. In the actual video, you this is like before you'd started, you sort of called out, oh, yeah, I'm going to, oh, you predicted a time of 16 hours. And you actually yeah. came in at like just under the 16, plus you got lost. Yeah. Tell us about the getting lost part. What sort of happened oh, there? horrible. Did you sort of get, oh, well, did your crew sort of send you down the wrong sort of street type thing or what, what sort of happened there? Yeah, so what, what happened is, um, so you've got the support car and um, basically they have, you have, the observer has to see you all the time. He's leading you along. So we put the observer on, on uh, a push bike so he could lead me you know, and, and he if that way he wouldn't get stuck all the traffic lights, so it's a safe time to get through London. So uh, actually, probably... can we? I just wanted to sort of set the context with listeners. It's not like a yeah. like I th- I thought a, I sort of thought that it was like a multi-person event, but this particular event no, was time trial. Yeah, it's just like one, like it was yeah. just you and you versus the time. Yeah. So, yeah. So you book you book your window in. And um, and then it's once again you've got a week's window, so you choose you choose when you're going to leave in that week, and you're really going by the by the English Channel boatman's advice. Yeah. So he, he he tells you when he thinks the best swim window is, and then you have to backlog X amount of hours, and you've got to run into that swim window. Yeah. But you have to get there by the high tide. Yeah. So if you get there well before the high tide, you can't go anyway. But so you've got to work out how long and how much rest you think you need to do the run. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I gave the boatman 24 hours notice. So whatever I ran under 24 hours was my rest period. Yeah. Uh, but the clock's always going. So, so, um, so what happened with, stopped, uh, so. so what happened with you getting lost? What, what sort of happened there? Like this oh, is on so, the runway. So I took off and yeah, so I had my observer on the bike who was leading me and, um, and the support crew gets stuck at the traffic light. So, so, um, he doubled back to get supplies. And uh, I missed the turn, and um, and I was running really well at that stage. So I ran ten minutes past, and he came back. He's like, "You've missed the turn," and I was like, "Oh, you know, where were?" You? And he said, "Well, your crew held me up doing movie interviews, so they were doing too many movie takes. So yeah. <laughs> I ended up having to run. Um, you know, I, I knew they were trying to tell me I'd only run an extra mile, but I knew it was like five k. And then afterwards, you know, they told me, "Yeah, you run an extra five k." And I'd never run one hundred and forty k before. You know, I'm thinking, oh, God, I've, now I've got to run 145K. What was your furthest and, um, up until that point, furthest run? Oh, I was doing 70K training runs. Yeah. So I didn't want to – I was thinking of doing more than that, but then you think if you do too much in training, you know, you've left your best form on the training track. So, yeah, so I was doing, you know, 70K runs probably every third week uh, leading in, and um, that was the longest I'd, I'd gone. So – and um, before the start of the event, the, the guy who, who was my observer, he's actually the first guy to finish the Arched Ark. And he's a great man, a man called uh, Edgar Edgy. And uh, he was saying that, you know, you can't, you can't run the event in this time because it's a hilly course and you can't start the swim in 24 hours because, you know, you'll be too tired. So he was putting all these negative thoughts in my head because I was thinking, well, you know, he knows the event. He's seen people try it yeah. all the time. So in the back of my head, and the other drama we had too, that I was running into the English Channel, which you know, we had a back of a hurricane from America. So so um, everyone that was booked to swim the channel that week, you know, solo swimmers and relay teams, they all pulled the pin. So there was all these dramas because I was running into the English Channel. Uh, and there was, actually, there was actually a chance that even when I got to the channel, the boatman would say that, that's no, too risky, I won't take you out. Because uh, all the solo swimmers had cancelled because it was such, you know, it was hurricane conditions. So, so, the, so I've never run 140k, let alone 145k. Yep. And then I'm running into an English Channel, which everyone's pulled the pin. So I'm thinking, you know, everything's conspiring against me. And then when, when the uh, when Edgar told me that I missed the turn because you know my crew was doing movie interviews, you know, I was kind of really upset <laughs> with the crew, yeah. thinking, you know, they're more they're more worried about doing the documentary than they are about you know where I am. So that was, I was kind of stewing on that too in my head. Yeah. So, um, yeah, <laughs> you just, just, but there's always dramas, you know, nothing ever goes perfect. And, yeah. 
But um, yeah, and it was a really tough um, run course. There's like long hills, and you, a lot of it you're running on, you know, on the side nature strips on, you know, thick, thick grass, and there's so, like trucks coming by. And, how long did it take to get out of sort of London? you know, sort of the CBD part of London, you know, the real sort of dense part of where all the traffic is. How long did that sort of take? Probably two or three hours, I'll be yeah. guessing, though. Right. And then you're kind of going on the highways. And um, and then I remember when we got to Dover, there was this massive climb. And it was probably a mile long, and I was thinking, oh, geez. Um, yeah, just the whole run's really hard. It's really hilly. Uh, so a lot of it you're running, you know, on the on the side, on the nature strips, and on thick, thick kind of weedy grass, and uh, there's cars that are passing a lot within a meter, you know. Uh, it was a, it was very windy conditions and raining, which I actually like. I like it cold, so yeah. that actually suited me. But but yeah, there was a chance that even when I finished the run, that the boatman wouldn't let me swim because you know because it was those it was terrible conditions, and we were on an eight meter tide, which is the biggest tide you can get. It was a king king spring tide. Because we only booked it a year before, so that was the only tide available. So yeah, so I was the back of a hurricane on an eight metre tide. Um, yeah, but because I'd done a double crossing with this boatman in bad conditions, he he knew my swimming capabilities. So so he gave me a window to to do the swim. So I was kind of lucky yeah. to actually even get permission to do it. You did the hundred and forty odd k's from uh, London, Marble Arch, right in the heart of London to Dover. Then uh, when you when you arrived at Dover just under sixteen hours later, g'day guys, Matt here. This podcast is a labor of love and all episodes are researched, scheduled, edited, created and promoted in my spare time. Typically, after an episode has been recorded, it can take another three hours of post-production activities to get the final cut. If I'm providing you with value and you wish to support my vision of sharing these inspirational stories to the world, you can do so at borntokickass.com and click on the Patreon banner. Your support will help to maintain the monthly podcast running costs and enable me to outsource repetitive tasks so I can bring you even more kick-ass episodes. Once again, if you want to support me in producing this podcast, head over to borntokickass.com and click on the Patreon banner. You can't miss it. And now back to the rest of the show. Did you then go to like a, a, a hotel type thing to yeah. sort of recuperate and rest? You did that for about eight and a half hours? Yeah, so basically I had to – so I had um, 24 hours, so so I had that whatever time there was yeah. um, before I could start the swim. So so um, we didn't really – we weren't really good logistically because it was like a 40-minute trip back to where we were staying. Yeah. Um, and then basically you try and eat food and try and sleep – and then you got to get up and drive back 40 minutes. So, and then you got to get on the boat, and then the boat actually drives you to the swim start. And it can't go all the way in; it, it gets within 50 meters, and you swim 50 meters in, and then he blows the siren, and then you go. So, so it's eight hours total. But by the time you drive home and back and jump on the boat, yeah. you know you're not really getting much um, <clears throat> sleep. So, so, so yeah. So, so what were you thinking? Like, you know, you've that's the first, that's the furthest you'd ever run. 140, 145-ish sort of Ks in just mm. under 16 hours. And then, you know, you're, you're sort of back at the hotel and and the, the clock's still going at this point. Yeah. So you go back to the hotel and you're trying to get as much nutrition and fuel and you're just trying to recover as much as you can in that short period of time. What were yeah. you sort of thinking at that point knowing – you still had to swim across the English Channel. Well, did you sort of were you having doubts at that point, or did you know that? Oh, I was a roller coaster. Um, when I finished the run, I was really happy. Like so I'd never run that far, but I was exhausted. So um, once I got in the car and they drove me back, like so it was a forty-minute drive back, and when I actually got back, I'd, I'd got all seized up, and they had to carry me up the stairs and put me in the bath, and I was chucking up, and so I had a really bad period then. Yeah. But then after I chucked up, I came good and I got some like scrambled eggs and pizza into me. Yep. 
But then um, in the morning, I, I could sleep. Did you manage to sleep? I, that, oh, I slept, but it was off and on because I was, you know, it was a weird sleep. It's kind of like trying to sleep in an airplane. Yeah. And uh, I, when I got up, my legs, oh, I could barely walk. It was like I'd been sledgehammered. Yeah. And uh, I couldn't get breakfast in the meal. I felt really sick. So I downed, I downed uh, quite a lot of water trying to flush out of my system. And I remember all the crew were up and they were all happy. And um, then we they, we drove down to the to the harbour where the boat the boats are moored, and um, yeah, it was it was like it was D Day, and you know it was a lot of dramas because you know my sister was emailing me telling me not to swim because you know it was too risky because everyone else had pulled out and I was too tired, and so I stopped you know answering my emails and phone calls because you know yeah it was a lot of lot of um, people telling me not to go because yeah because everyone else had pulled the pin. Yep. So, um, so yeah, it was, um, it was pretty, yeah. Oh, I still thought I could get across cause I'd done a double crossing without a wetsuit in bad conditions. Yep. So I thought once I was in the water, you know, my stomach would settle down and, you know, I'd come good cause swimming, swimming's my background. So I always back myself. You know, you'd done the run and you're sort of standing now at, I guess at the shore of, uh, Dover about to commence the swim across, you yeah. know, the swim leg is your forte. Obviously, yeah. your body would have been fully destroyed, you know, from running for 16 hours and trying to recover after that. Obviously, there would have been a bit of um, trepidation or a bit of nervousness, if you like, knowing you still got to swim across the channel. But did you sort of have a bit of confidence knowing that the next leg, the swim leg, is your your, your strength? Were you sort of drawing oh, I was that? confident, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, was, I was really confident that, yeah, there are other people like were really doubtful, and but um, yeah, it was um, it was funny because we got when we got to the beach, like I said, the boat the boat drives you around to the to the beach he reckons is the best for the current, so it's like it's probably a twenty to thirty minute boat trip, and then he can't go all the way in so because it gets too shallow, so you've got to dive off the boat and swim fifty meters into shore, and um, so I, I jumped in. I was obviously tired, so. I jumped in and kind of swam, swam in and I kind of crawled up to stand up and there were people walking their dogs and they thought I was an illegal immigrant who'd yeah, come across I'm, the I'm channel. Yeah, I'm seeing that. So what happened there? Yeah, because like... I, I looked so fatigued. So <laughs> so um, they called the police and um, I didn't know this happened. So then you know, the siren went off and I jumped in the water and uh, my crew were getting interrogated by the police, you know, because they thought I was an illegal immigrant. So yeah. that, that was really good for us because that got like worldwide coverage and Something so silly like that. So, well, they thought that you were trying to get into the UK. Yeah, they thought I'd swum from England to to because uh, I looked that fatigued, yeah. and all I'd swum was fifty meters from the boat to the shore. But it was a really rough day, and I got pounded. And there's no sand there; it's like these massive pebbles. Yeah. And my quads were sledgehammered, so I was trying to stand up. So I looked. I must have looked like I already swum the channel. <laughs> Just yeah. trying to swim that fifty meters in. And when I stood up, yeah, some people walking their dogs called the coppers and. And um, yeah, so I didn't actually see that happen. They interrogated my crew when I started the swim, and um, and I heard about it after the event. And when I got home, I had emails from all around the world. It was it was a massive story, like you know, emails from Brazil and CNN and yeah. BBC. And because I didn't get access to my emails for a couple of weeks, it was too late. So, mm-hmm. but yeah, it was like it was a huge. Um, so my sponsors were happy because they got all this. All this silly coverage for something so yeah, something so crazy. But Just, no, I was I was confident um, in my swimming abilities. Tell us about uh, so the actual swim leg. Like you, you've you've started and you you're off. You know you've started swimming, uh, and this is thirty four k's. You know from uh, as the crow flies, I guess from uh, England to uh, France, which you did in twelve hours, twelve and a half hours. Tell us about the uh, the fueling. How do you how do you tell us about your fueling strategy during the swim? How do you take on board nutrition? Do, does the crew on the boat sort of give you? How do they sort of fuel you? Do you sort of take on board liquid based fuels or food or how do you do that? Yeah, I mean, basically you just try and keep your insulin levels stable. So I was just having sugary drinks or or um, lollies or baked beans. Uh, but I try and just have, um, as for as long as I can, just quick drinks or or lukewarm drinks just to save time. So I try and make my feeds, you know, kind of three to ten seconds because 
because I, I feed every – I mean, you can feed whenever you want as long as you don't touch the boat. Yeah. So I always pre-organise that I feed every 20 minutes and I try and do my feeds as quick as possible. I try and, you know, have a, like a three-second drink and generally I'll have like one of those uh, bike biddens with a bit of string around it. So so the, um, the, guy, the people on the boat will have a whiteboard and they'll just write, you know, feed in two minutes and I'll just nod my head and then they'll throw the bottle over with a bit of string. Yeah. And I was quickly sip it and just throw it away, and they pull the rope in, and yeah. So I was pretty much having um, just like sports drinks for most of the way until I started getting cold at the end. So I was then having warm tea and um, some of those um, power bar lollies, which yeah. taste really nice. So with the uh... so yeah, just trying just whatever whatever sugar you know sugar, but just trying to have a quick feed. And... So did your crew monitor the time? Like you sort of said, every sort of twenty minutes, was that? The, the management and the monitoring of the 20 minute sort of intervals was that sort of all handled by your crew or did you have a watch where you sort of were looking and every 20 minutes you sort of motion to your crew oh it's it's give me some fuel who no, sort of that's, managed that's the crew yep yeah that's the crew's job so so they have their watch going and but like if I'm if I'm feeling like I'm getting low on sugar I'll I'll say look I want to feed now yep but otherwise, yeah, it's every 20 minutes. But if I feel like I'm getting sugar depleted, you know, I'll, I'll you know, shout, oh, can I have a feed? Yeah. You know, whatever, drink or so. But but the base plan is, yeah, every 20 minutes for me. And some, some people do longer. Um, yeah, so it depends. Every person's different. But I, I find every 20 minutes and I try and keep my feeds, you know, if I can, to within three seconds. Yeah. But when you get tired, you might take 10 or 20 seconds. But. How do you sort um, of, I try and have really quick quick feeds and not waste time. And yeah. how do you find the digestion while you swim? Like I've you know taken food on board while running and digesting while running. How do you sort of find the digestion part of of trying to digest whatever you've sort of consumed while you're swimming? Is it um, pretty? Is it different to digesting food while you're running? Oh, it would be yeah, because. Because you, yeah, because you, you're horizontal when you're swimming, and I'm pretty much having fluids too, so so I don't really have any dramas, and I never swallow water. I'm pretty lucky, so yeah, um, yeah I never really have problems when I when I swim. Yeah, um, yeah, I just um, just try and keep my sugar levels up, and we had a lot of problems though, because it was so it was such an awkward chop that every all of my crew was seasick, so right. there was only one guy left who wasn't seasick, and. A lot of the others were um, having to go downstairs. They were like really ill. Yeah. So um, there was only one guy who wasn't uh, Steve, so he survived. And I was lucky that because otherwise I'd no one to feed me. So. Yeah, that'd be fine. But he kind of survived. But, but yeah, a lot of the crew got very, very sick. Because yeah. sometimes it's worse than the boat because um, they were really kind of – it was an awkward chop. It was wind against tide. So the boat's kind of getting, you know, thrown at all kinds of angles. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that, we had a few dramas like that. But we were kind of running out of crew because they're all, you know, very, very ill. So, do you also take on board caffeine at all to maintain your um, alertness? Yeah, not not kind of towards. I might have like flat coke or lukewarm coffee at the end. Right. Uh, I love my coffee, so. Yep. But uh, but I kind of save that to when you you know if you're really struggling. Yep. So yeah, like a bit of caffeine at the end if you. If you're really hitting the wall, uh, but not not the whole way, just kind of at moments. Now, um, but it does, yeah, it doesn't really matter what you eat as long as um, you keep your insulin levels stable. Yeah. So that's the main thing. So, so yeah, so you got to eat something that that really that you can digest. But you know, if it's not, um, you know, it's not sitting in your stomach and and just gives you enough sugar to, to go for the next 19 minutes and yeah. you know to, for the next feed and. Um, if you, but I always, if I'm feeling flat, I always say oh, I might feed for ten minutes for a while, and you know, to get on top of things again. So, but but generally, yeah, it's every twenty minutes, and yeah, um, yeah. So so you so thirty four k's like that's as the crow flies. Um, yeah, not, so not did, this one though. <laughs> so yeah, how far do you reckon you actually swam across the channel? Oh, I swam fifty four k. Fifty four. This, this was right. shocking. This was. It was an eight metre tide, so you think you're swimming a straight line, but then you see your GPS chart later, and I end up swimming yeah, 54k. And was that something that you'd planned or budgeted for in terms of your your energy expenditure? You know, like oh, I knew I knew it was going to be 
yeah, like I said, everyone everyone had pulled the pin on the swim, all the solo swimmers, and even the relay teams didn't go out, which is six six people, which only have to do an hour each. Yeah. So no one else went out because it was yeah, it was a it's the biggest tide you could get, plus the the back of the hurricane, which you had wind against tide. So it was really awkward chops. So it was very frustrating kind of swim because you couldn't get a rhythm because like your leg was in one angle, your arm was in another angle. You could never get your body stable. So it was just awkward chop. So it was just um, very frustrating because, yeah, it was like someone ragdolling me the whole time. Right. Um, and that's why people, people on the boat were getting really sick too because it was the waves are hitting them from all different angles because yeah. of the wind against chop. And like I said, you think you're swimming a straight line, but I remember I thought, um, you know, the swim would take about eight hours. And I remember eight hours, you know, I couldn't see France. Yeah. I looked up, I'm thinking, Jesus. Um, and then as we got closer, um, the boatman said, looks like you're going to land on this lighthouse, which was about 5 to 10K to my right. And I, I thought, there's no way we're landing there. And sure enough, we landed there. So you don't realise how far you're getting swept. Yeah. Um, and it was just horrible. Like the last 400 metres took me about half an hour. I was just swimming on the spot, sprinting. Yeah. Yeah. So it was just a really tough tough swim while swimming against the tide and what was the feeling like when your feet actually hit the ground you know you've been swimming for 12 and a half hours or you've done the run you've you've swum 12 and a half hours 54 odd k's across the channel what was the feeling like when you you actually felt the 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 ground your feet touch the ground and you were touching sort of french soil what was that like Oh, so I, I landed uh, where this lighthouse was and it was pitch black. Yeah. And I made a mistake that um, I, I started turning towards the lighthouse too soon and I got stuck stuck against the current or I should have swam further in and I would have been protected. Um, so, yeah, so but I couldn't hear. They were screaming at me, but I couldn't hear my earplugs and I was sprinting all of a sudden I realised I wasn't getting any closer. And then the boatman kind of parked the boat right next to me to try and block the tide and he said, you know, you've got 500 yards. And I just swam for it. I was going for it, and I and I could barely, I could barely get in. So I remember, um, even ten metres ago, I wasn't sure I could get in. I was that tired, and I was just hoping. I was, I was, so I was aiming for these rocks where the lighthouse was, and it was pitch black, and I could just see the lighthouse, you know, the light going around, and I was just doing, you know, hoping to touch a rock. I was just waiting, yeah. and eventually I touched the rock, and I had to climb out and get fully out of water, and. I was just exhausted because I had to sprint, you know, that last half an hour. And um, the whole swim was just, you know, I got ragdolled the whole swim. You could never, you could never get in a rhythm. You could never switch your brain off because it was just that awkward chop wind against tide. So it was just, um, it was just, yeah, it was the hardest swim I've done. It was harder than my double crossing. Um, It was only 12 and a half hours, but just the awkward conditions. It wasn't like super big waves. It was just uh, awkward waves. When I did my double crossing, they were big waves, but you could smash through them. Yeah. Where these ones, you you just could never get a rhythm because you know the waves were all hitting you from all angles. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was a very um, frustrating swim and very taxing swim. So, could never switch my brain off. I was always feeling like my body was all getting contorted in different angles, and then having a sprint on the spot at that end. Yeah, it was just so hard. And, um, it was just so relieved when I when I finished. Yeah. On the uh, on your video crossing the line, uh, <clears throat> the actual video starts off with footage of you after the swim. You know your your mates, uh, the, your crew are, you know you'd, you'd landed in Calais in France and they were uh, ushering you or helping you back into the car, uh, yeah. and you look like a full on zombie in terms of yeah. um, completely depleted. You know you, you'd run one hundred and forty k's. Tried, yeah. yeah, and then uh, swum the English Channel, and then uh, yeah, the footage of you of them dragging you back into the car was um, yeah, look, you you look pretty um, destroyed at that point. And yeah, then, I, was, I was very very fatigued. Yeah. Were you having doubts at that? Like at that point, you know, you'd arrived in Calais, you'd swum the Channel in Calais, you then uh, waited ten and a half hours uh, yeah. before commencing the bike leg. Yeah. How was that? How was that? Uh, that period between the swim and the bike, were you oh, doubting that, yourself at that point? Nah, no, nah, I, was, I was confident. But I thought the bike leg would be the easiest bit, but 
But uh, it was a super hilly bike course. <laughs> we still had the big strong winds too, so the bike was really hard as well. But because but I um, I actually landed in Boulogne, I, I landed um, – I was so far off course, it was an hour boat trip to the nearest um, port. And then the second crew picked us up and it was a half an hour drive to the hotel. So the clock was always going. And I was I was well ahead of the previous record. So the crew thought they'd give me the full 12 hours rest because um, I was ahead of the previous record. I had enough up my sleeve. And because I looked so bad when I finished the swim, they thought they'd better um, you know give me the full 12 hours. But I couldn't sleep anyway, so... I was that too tired, so I got up. I had to get the crew up, and that wasted another hour because we had to get, you know, the bikes in the car, drive to the start. So I ended up my total rest was I think nine hours, but yeah. an hour and a half of that was getting from the boat to the hotel, and then another hour of that was getting the crew up and driving to the start. So you got the so, crew yeah, up. So, yeah, what, what I, could, were they doing? I couldn't. Oh well, they were going to give me the full twelve hours. Yeah. You know, because because when I finished the swim, I was a mess. Yeah. So, um, so they they thought, well, he's he's ahead of the previous record, so we might as well make sure he's. They didn't think I'd be able to start the bike because I was that I was that bad when I finished the swim. Yeah. So they thought we'll give him the full twelve hours, but you know, I was having broken sleep. I was that exhausted. I thought I'm not going to feel any better three hours later. So I, I got up and I I woke everyone up, said let's go. You know, so we had to get we had to get all the bike in the car and drive to the to the official start area. So it was another hour wasted of doing that. So, so that's why I'm going back. You know, I want to cut out all these rest periods and get logistically be smarter and, you know, have accommodation close to the, you know, to the swim start and things like that. So, tell us about the start of the bike legs. So, you've done the run, 145 k's, the swim, 54, 54 odd k's, and then the, yeah. you had the bike leg, which is 291 k's from. Uh, or was it Calais to, Calais to Paris? To Arc de Triomphe, yeah. yeah. What, what were you sort of, how were you feeling physically at that point? I mean, I was tired, but I was I was functional. So I was, yeah. I was confident then. I thought the bike leg, you know, you just, you just cruise along. Yeah. But, um, but I still had the strong winds. So it was big headwinds and, and um, they wouldn't actually, they don't tell you the schematics of the course. So we, we presumed it to be, you know, undulating, but there were, there were like 10 really big climbs and, so, so you know, I was in the, I didn't have the right gears. I was going up climbs with big headwinds, and so, um, yeah, the bike was really tough, and um, yeah, so, so, yeah, all three legs are tough, and that's why I reckon it's, it's a great event. And um, yeah, I, I suffered, I suffered um, on the bike too, and yeah, I thought I'd just, um, you know, I'd just sit on it and it'd be nice flat course, and I just roll to Paris, but no, it was up and down hills and big headwinds. And, uh, I had a lot of tough periods on the bike too. And, what was the traffic but, like um, as you headed into Paris? Well, that's the other thing. Um, you get stuck at all the lights. So so I was actually pretty lucky. That's the only bit where I had a bit of luck. But we, we came in kind of late at night and it was, I think it was a holiday season. So the traffic wasn't as bad. So so you get, so when, if the observer gets stuck at the lights, you've got to get, you get stuck at the lights too. You have to wait because I don't know where I'm going. He has to witness it. So yes, yeah, so you lose a little bit of time going to Paris, but when I got to Paris, I, I knew I had the record, so it was kind of like you could chill out a bit, and yeah. I did. I wasn't too perturbed then, so I could kind of take in the scenery. And, yeah. Um, yeah, so when I got to Paris, that was actually quite a good, good patch. I didn't mind stopping because I knew I had, I was ahead of the previous record, and and um, so you know you, you could relax a bit. So right at the end, you know, you uh, the end of the bike leg. Did you actually cycle down the Arc de Triomphe? I mean, the uh, Champs Elysees. Yeah, if you actually go right up to the Arc de Triomphe, you go, you stop about twenty meters before on the right. So, so yes. Yeah. <laughs> what was that like when so, you you sort of you know at the uh, the start of the uh, Champs Elysees and you're looking up and the the finish line's there, you know, the Arc de Triomphe. What were you sort yeah. of feeling at that point, knowing that you know you can see the end point? And you'd been going, yeah. What was what was that sort of feeling like? Oh, it's kind of surreal because um, I had really had the last hour to soak it in, and, and it's just such an amazing city, Paris. So um, yeah, it was just it was, it was I was kind of relieved, and it was surreal. It was a mixture of everything, and I was exhausted, and yeah. I actually felt better towards the end than I did probably at the start of the bike. Cause 
you know, I had probably five Macca stops where they were getting me Mac McDonald's and I was just pumping the calories into me. And, <laughs> and it's kind of like I said, the last kind of bit where you're stopping at lights, you kind of, you're getting rest and I knew I was ahead of the previous record so I could, you know, kind of relax. And yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was a bit of everything. It was kind of surreal and rel- relief and exhaustion, but, but, um, but yeah, it's, um, so you finished it in, uh, or was it 61 hours and 27 yeah, minutes? 27 minutes. W- was there a point on the actual whole event that you really thought that you, did you ever think that you'd pull the plug? Were you ever sort of doubting nah. yourself? Oh, two hours into the swim, I had a bit of a hissy fit. Um, cause I was, I was getting ragdolled in the water and I was feeling sorry for myself. And yeah. I said to the boatman, I said, Oh, is this going to get any better? And the boatman, he's got a real dry sense of humor. He's like, I thought you were a swimmer. Swim. Yeah. He kind of he gave me he gave me no love. Yeah. And I thought, oh, fair enough. And yeah, you know, I just kept going. But so I had a bit of a bad patch. Um, yeah, probably two hours in the swim, and I had a bad patch when I got lost in the run. That kind of oh, that upset me because you know because I'd never run that far before, and I was running into the you know English Channel, which everyone had cancelled, and yeah. so I thought, oh, she my bloody crew let me down there. But but they're all you know, it's never going to be perfect, and. So, but it was never a point where I was going to pull out. It was just, you know, just um, bits where you feel sorry for yourself. We just got to sort of toughen up and get over it, and in the, uh, you know, keep going because you know, you know, it's never going to. It's not going to be a nice event. Yeah. It's not going to be a sightseeing uh, tour. In the kind of thing. So in your video, you know, uh, if you choose to do it, you got to put up with it. In your video, crossing the line, um, it showed probably two thirds of the way into the bike leg. Your sister Tammy sent you a text message about. Um, about your dad, how much, yeah. how much was, how much did that sort of help your spirit sort of continue forward? Oh, that was huge because I was, I was really suffering. Yeah. Uh, then I was going up, going up some of those big climbs and uh, I, I, I had semi-torn muscle in, in my, in my quad. I was struggling to push, I was running out of gears. I didn't have enough proper gears for the hills and I was struggling up the hills, you know, creeping up these hills and yeah, because my father, uh, we went to this event before anyone had done it uh, years ago and my, um, but it ne- never eventuated and uh, my father passed away so he never got, got to see me do it. So so Tammy sent me a text, you know, saying, oh, dad, would be proud of you and this and that and yeah. that really uh, lifted me up and yeah. I was like, oh, you know, great father. He used to, he was a printer and he used to, um, you know, he's, basically work for the family all day, you know. We'd go on trips overseas doing marathon swims and he'd be funding it, you know, standing behind a machine all day. So yeah. I was like, I had really great parents. And so, yeah, so my father kind of, he was, he was, um, he was keen for me to do this event before anyone had done it and it never eventuated. We never got the sponsors. And, and then later it became a sanctioned event where, you know, people through Enduro Man that people actually do it and, you know, pay a fee and it gets logged. So, so yeah, so that kind of, yeah, that really lifted me at the end. And, yeah. You know, you've done all these incredible th- events and you've suffered so much, you know, through all these events and you, you've triumphed so much as well. Where do you think your strength comes from? You know, like, uh, uh, you know, at those points where you're suffering so much and you're really doubting yourself whether you can continue, whether it's swimming 48 k's around Manhattan Island or you're doing the arch to arc. Where do you sort of draw your strength from? I think it's just um, it's just the journey, it's persistence. You know, like yeah, I've had a lot of bad races where something's gone wrong, and you kind of learn from it, and and your limits get better as you get older, you get more confident. You know, like my first channel attempt, I you know I had to get resuscitated and. And then 10 years later, I'm doing a double crossing, you know. So as you get older, you, you learn what works for you and you mentally get stronger because, you know, you've done more base training and, you know, the pros and cons of things. And so, yeah, you kind of learn from your failures and um, it makes you tougher. And, uh, so I just think as I got older, you, you know, you, you just your life experiences, it, you, your bad experiences too um, toughen you up and, um, so I just think it's a journey really that, you know, the arch sharks probably, I'm at, probably at a good age to do it now. Cause you know, I've done years of Ironmans and marathon swimming and, um, you know, a lot of uh, marathon runs. And so although I had never 140 K 
you know, I've got that base training, yeah. you know, and the double crossing channel and things like that. So, Over the years, you know, you've won so many events around the world, open ocean water swims, and you've done marathon swims and stuff like that. Is there a particular event or, or maybe a particular moment in your career to date? What would be your proudest moment um, oh, in, in your career? Is there sort of a moment? That, or, oh, or just in general, swimming. just w- whether it's uh, triathlon or swimming or the arch to arc, is there a moment that really sticks out in your mind as being oh, your I've had proudest a few, moment? a few good ones. Yeah. My first, my first Manhattan swim um, in 2000, I was actually coming second and I, I won that by two seconds. My first Manhattan. That was a that was a tough one. Um, my first triathlon win. Well, I won the New Zealand half Ironman, and then um, then I came back and then I won the state Olympic distance triathlon. Then I went to New Zealand. And I um, I went. I, I was fourth overall in the Ironman New Zealand. So I had a really good month uh, that time. So that was a really good month. I love that month. Um, yeah, so triathlon terms, that was probably my, my good good patch. Um, my first Manhattan was a good one. My first uh, single crossing in the channel because I didn't make it the year before. That was that was pretty big for me mentally because you know, like I said, the year before I nearly died. Uh, my double crossing, you know, I was pretty proud of that because, like I said, that was a rough night and seven people got pulled out trying to do singles that night. So, so I got up and back, and only only the other guy coach got across that night. So. That was a big, big achievement. I thought. Um, oh, my 2009 Manhattan. I, f- I was in very good shape. You know, that was probably physically my best swim I've ever done. Um, yeah, so that kind of stands out. So they all stand out for different reasons. Yep. Um, I don't really have a favourite. They're all. It's kind of a journey. Yep. You know, some some swims I appreciate because, you know, it was tough, but I got through it and. Yeah. Uh, other, t- you know, like my 2009 Manhattan, I just felt incredible the whole way. I had perfect preparation, and yeah. um, that time I bet I bet all the relay teams home and everything. I had a ripper swim, yeah. and I didn't get tired for one bit. I felt great the whole way around. And other Manhattan swims have been really hard, you know. So, yeah. so yeah, so they're all different for different reasons. And um, I've had some shocking races too, where you kind of think, oh, you, you learn from those too, and. They make you stronger, and you know you work out where you went wrong, and you know you try and try and get better from it. So I've had plenty of bad races too, where you kind of learn from your mistakes. And so yeah, I've had had um yeah, it's been a roller coaster, but yeah, yeah it's been I've had got something out of all all the um all the events. So how do you define success, like in life, j- just generally? Is it is, how would you sort of define success? Oh, I don't really have a. I don't really. You kind of like even after you've done it, you you're satisfied for a while, but then you kind of look for something else. So yeah. I don't really have a, a motto. But well, I guess as you as you go along, like you might start with a short triathlon, and then then when you know you can do the short triathlon, you go to a half Ironman. And then when you know you can do a half Ironman, you do an Ironman. So it's just kind of a journey that you get to one level and you think, oh, I'm good enough to do this now. I can go to this, and yeah. so I guess that's it. In, for human beings, that's probably how we all, you know, we go from one to the next and, you know, you, you realise you, you work out your capabilities and you think, oh, geez, I can do this better now because I've, I've done this. Do you ever so doubt yourself? Weird. Oh, yeah, especially when you're younger. As you get older, I'm much better mentally now. I feel much more stable because you've done it all before kind of thing and, you know, I know the pros and cons of, you know, like channel swims and yeah. And things that were, when I was younger, you know, you hear all the stories of the channel and you, know, you, you, you don't understand the tides and things like that and, you know, how to handle cold water and, you know, more years of swimming through winters and how much body fat I've got to put on and if I'm feeling this is not the end of the world, I can get through it. You know, so as I've got older, I've got more mentally, mentally stable, I think, because you kind of got more life experiences. Just on advice, if you could make a phone call to the twenty-year-old John Wisser and give him some advice, what would you tell him? He wouldn't listen. <laughs> <laughs> Back then, I I always did my own thing, and you know, I was not, known for uh, not listening to my coach and you know doing silly things, and yeah. uh, so I would never listen. It was you know, I had to make my own mistakes and learn. And, 
So, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, he wouldn't have listened. Yeah. Now, if you could give uh, some advice to a listener who's wanting to either, you know, swim the English Channel or swim around, um, you know, Manhattan Island or even attempt the Arch to Arc, is there any advice you, you could give someone uh, who's wanting to attempt one of these things? Yeah, but I mean, every everyone's different, so it's working out all the pros and cons, and um, yeah. So, like I said, um, you got to work out how long you think the channel would take you. So, the longer in the water, the, the more body fat you got to have, and getting nutrition, what what works for you for nutrition. Um, you know, as when I mean when I say trading, you know, nutrition with a channel, it's basically what kind of sugar you can stomach that will stay in your stomach and not make you sick. You know, and then you're keeping your food levels up. So it's just it's just really doing that in training, and then writing a list. You know, what foods work for you, and then then you have it all in the boat ready. You have enough, you know, to be in the water for for three days, and you end you know, up throwing most of it out, but you have it all in the boat. You know, because it's just the one day in your life. So yeah, it's working out a training program that that you know that's that works for you, and getting in really your mental state. I think the mental state's a big thing. You know, knowing the pros and cons of what you're up against when you do an ultra event. So cause it's very easy to get psyched out if, if you don't have full information about something yep. or if you know, okay, this can go wrong. And if it does, I, I then know how to deal with it. Uh, you know, just things like if I swim the channel and I miss the tide, you know, it might add four hours on the swim, but I can still get in. You know, where if, if nobody tells you that and you're swimming on the spot and um, yeah, you, that might make you quick because you're thinking, oh, geez, I'm no good. Or So it's really just getting information about what you're up against and yeah. working out what you think would stop you and um, just working out all the pros and cons so you've got good mental stability and you're doing enough functional training that you can, on that one day, you can dig into that well and pull it off. Yeah. Are you um have you got any sort of plans for the future for are you are you planning or actively working towards another um challenge of some sort are you sort of actively uh doing any, uh planning for anything Yeah I'm um I'm I'm doing the arch dark again uh the last week of August this year Yeah so I'm back in uh, preparation for the arch dark again All right Yeah cuz you did that in 2014 and you broke the world record and then I think a French guy broke your world record was it like the year later year after or, or, or 2016 was yeah that right? yeah that's right yeah he's taken taking an hour off it so yep. so yeah so um yeah i was, I was always going to go back anyway because i thought i could take a fair bit off because um all the things that went wrong yep. um but yeah that's given me even more motivation so i was supposed to do it um september last year but i tore my calf and yep. um yeah, so I've had to postpone it till till August this year. So I was lucky. I was lucky they gave me a new window because it's it's really popular. It's booked up for for years. Or so so I was lucky to get a new window. And um, yeah, so the plan is hopefully touch wood that uh, they break down. But yeah, last week of August this year, I have another crack. And if you don't get lost this time, you'll uh, yeah. you'll probably go under his time. Fingers crossed. Well, that's you don't the get plan. Lost. I want to try and actually yeah take a fair bit off because. Yeah. I want to um, I want to run a run a bit quicker, and I want to actually take on the channel like within 17, 18 hours rather than twenty four hours. Yep. So I'm going to start the channel swim a lot earlier, have less rest. Yep. We've got accommodation right right where the run finishes this time, so I'm going to go straight to bed. Then I get up in the morning. That's where the the boats are moored, yep. and then I'm on I'm on a five and a half metre tide this time, so the tide's going to be a lot smaller. So the swim should be I should swim quite a few hours faster. Um, and not not be as exhausted at the end. Um, and then we're also we're going to have a camp van. So wherever I finish the swim, I'm going to go straight to bed in the camp van. They're going to drive me to the start. Yep. I'm going to try and start the bike within three hours. So I'm going to try and take another six hours off there. So, and we're going to have hill climbing gears this time. So I'm going to have a 31 gear on the back so I can spin over the hills. Because uh, last time I just ran out of gears and I was in, had big headwinds and. So I'm hoping to take, yeah, I'm just going to hopefully try and get under 50 hours this time. Yeah. And whereabouts can people find you online and, you know, follow your your updates and, and reach out and say hi and stuff and, and follow your, you know, your, your journey to uh, the next Arch to Arc? 
Yeah, there's a there's a Facebook page where um yeah, it's called uh JVW goes A to A. So um yeah, I'm not I'm not really a computer person, but I've got um the crew's doing it for me, so they're gonna do a lot of updates and yep. once I start training, you know, they do like training logs and and uh when I'm actually doing the event they've got like a tracker and they'll do like a write up of how I'm going and yep. and all that. So yeah, so they can keep keep the update on that Facebook page. Yep. And, and what's your website? Um, the website's just uh, chongganwist.com. Okay. Yeah, cool. Well, I'll put those links in the show notes. And, uh, oh, yeah, thanks, people Benny. people want to um, reach out and say hi, yeah, they can uh, they can reach out to you that way. Uh, and I'll also put a link to your or your, your video, Crossing the Line, uh, the 2014 uh, London to Paris 483 Ultra Triathlon, the um, Arch to Arc. Um, but yeah, th- thanks again for coming on. Um, oh, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's been incredible um, what you've achieved, and uh, it's an incredible story. And uh, yeah, good luck with all your training. You know, leading up to uh, to August this year. And uh, oh, yeah, thanks, man. Make sure you post heaps of photos and stuff online, and uh, yeah, we can uh, follow your progress and uh, cheer you on. Oh, thanks a lot, mate. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. You've just been listening to the Born to Kick-Ass podcast at borntokickass.com. If you liked what you heard and want more, please subscribe on iTunes, give a five-star rating and a kick-ass review. This really helps to boost our presence and continues to allow us to introduce you to the most fascinating people on the planet. Welcome aboard and catch you next time.